All right, guys, we're back again with another great episode of PFREI. I'm your host, Ukwam Bilal. Oh, man, we got a very, very special, special, special. Did I say special? Let me say it again. Special, special. Oh, wow. The man and myth, the legend, no pressure, Mr. Dave Van Horn from PPR. Now, What's happening, Fuquan? Oh, man, I tell you guys, I'm a, I'm a real estate junkie. I started real estate in 99. I flipped a bunch of houses. The market crashed. I took a few licks. Listening one day to, um, I think I saw an email or something I got that you was going to do a presentation. Um, I had the chance to come up to your office. I saw the presentation, had the chance to come to your office, meet you in person. I tell you guys, this is the kindest guy that I know. <laughs> Seriously, it changed my mind about the way of how I interact with people. My first interaction with you, I drove two hours to your office. And you told me I was dressed yeah. a little sharp. I had my suit on, three piece. It was like, wow, this, this guy is dressed. You look good, Fuquan. You look good <laughs> when you came in. So the the information that you shared with me that day, you took me out to. You didn't even know me. You took me out to lunch. You spent two hours on lunch and two hours in your office explaining to me. You spent about four hours that day, and then you didn't even know who I was. And I, that was, I was really grateful for that. And you gave me a lot of inside knowledge and jewels, which people in the real estate business, I'm talking about flipping properties, it's more like cutthroat, you know, where they don't want to tell you the lenders they're using or how they're doing it. And you just opened it up and told me everything. And I was really grateful for that. And I remember that to this day. And I remember your, your business partner, John Sweeney, said to me, he said, hey, this business is not easy. It's, it's really tough. Said, this guy trying to discourage me, but I found out he's absolutely right. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> so without further ado, basically your background is, you know, since 2007, you started this note company, PPR, and now it's, it's, you have a holding company that manages several funds that buy and sell and hold residential mortgage notes nationwide. And you've been involved in, this, in, in the residential and commercial real estate uh, business for about 30 years. You're licensed realtor also. Um, you started off fun, doing fundraising, a whole bunch of different things. And you also own a considerable portfolio of residential real estate. So you still have some diversity in real property as well, which is great. So we'll talk a little about that. My first question I always ask the guest, Dave, is why are you passionate for real estate investing? Uh, wow. I, you know what? It, I think it was the... Uh... <laughs> At first, it was my I was uh, working in construction, and I would go home all you know decimated from the day, and and I was living with my mom because I couldn't really afford an apartment, and she was like, "Why don't you try real estate?" She goes, "There's more millionaires in real estate than anything else. Why don't you give that a try?" Because like she knew I was discouraged because I had just graduated from college and couldn't get a job in my field, and and I was working the grind in construction. And, um, and that, that was how I initially ventured into it. But then I think it was the, the idea of owning cash flow and all the tax advantages and really the, the cash flow and the tax advantages. And it was, um, you know, being, I was handy and I knew if I could buy something, you know, at a discount, fix it up, that's where I could add value and, uh, you know, hopefully make it work. And, uh, I had a grandfather that had a couple of, uh, duplexes he had like three duplexes uh you know and and i knew that story of my grandfather and things like that but so it, it was it was some of that stuff awesome now your, your mom is your best tenant as you say <laughs> <laughs> not anymore she actually anymore. sold her house and oh, she uh, sold yeah house. yeah <laughs> she, yeah she sold the house and she's in an over 55 community and uh she's happy because my uh Actually, two of my sisters live where my mother lives, and it's like the episode of Maud or something, you know, the TV show, the yeah. old TV show. Nobody probably remembers the show, but. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, awesome, it's a, man. Hey, you know, what, what, I, what I admired about the, the PPR organization is the value add that it gave. Like, I would literally, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I kind of stopped drinking like two years ago, but I would actually get a six pack. And I would go into the back office and I would just sit there the entire Saturday and just, you know, have a six pack and crack one open and just listen to that back office and like take everything in and then put it into action. So that information that you guys were sharing, that back scene, those phone calls, all that stuff helped so many people. And I'm, I'm pretty sure PPR DNA is in every note company, a majority, probably 70 percent of what's <laughs> out there because you guys train people and people went out there to show people the way, partner with them. And it all comes back to that. So truly grateful for that. But 
you know, moving forward, you guys have grown so much um, in the business. I know you guys have yeah. like 20, 30 plus employees and, you know, you had this whole big mega operation and, and you raised to date probably a hundred million dollars. Let's, let's shift a little bit and talk about the challenges that come along with that because everybody wants to be a fund manager. Everybody wants to raise money. Everybody wants to do this. I mean, it's always exciting, but one, you need a team, you need process. Like you told me uh, when I first got in the space, you need three things to be successful in the business. That scale, the lot of scale, the capital, and where to find a product. So what are some of the challenges going into that as you scale up to kind of make sure you have those three things consistently? Well, well, there, there's more than one question you, you threw at me there. <laughs> no, but, um, whichever one. <laughs> the, yeah, which one? Pick one and try to remember what the other ones were. <laughs> the, um, I think the big thing today with raising capital, especially as we go out to larger institutional capital or we see larger institutional partners, is they're very, uh, they definitely have a magnifying glass on our compliance with our investors. So, for example, we follow INREV guidelines, I-N-R-E-V, which is a, a professional standard of small balance real estate funds can utilize to run a fund with good governance. So that's one place you could start. So, And they have about 18 main ways uh, that you should look at to run a more professional fund, even if you're a small fund. And... It's like a work in progress thing. It's not necessarily you have to be, you know, 150% in each category, but it's like you can dial up your game. And I'll give you maybe an example or two. It's, uh, you know, maybe, do you have an investment committee? Like I know if it, at my company, if we do a purchase over 5 million, there's a little committee that forms and they sign off on the purchase, for example. Does that make sense? So it's not... Absolutely. Some, so it's not some acquisitions cowboy in the in the in the room down the hall just randomly buying whatever they feel like or something. You, you get what I mean. So and yeah. it's those types of checks and balances on the fund, everything from uh, cash flow management in your organization to security in your organization, all these different components, as well as uh, you know a lot of these are designed to protect uh, the investors. Some of those guidelines. So if you ever get a chance, you can look at some of those guidelines. Another thing that we do is we utilize uh, Verify Investor, for example, which is a third-party accreditation company. So they actually uh, keep us compliant. They keep all the documents. They manage all the uh, OFAC, anti-terrorism, uh, what else, anti-money laundering, all that type of stuff. And uh, you know, we're, we're the type of offering that generally solicits. So we are allowed to advertise and one of the requirements in that case is to you know, not only have people say they're accredited but they have to prove it and then you have to actually you know be compliant and keep those documents and i don't know that you're off the hook if you use a third party to do that but it definitely shifts some of that liability of that compliance to do it properly and what i notice is the third party organizations like investor capital or investment big investment funds they appreciate how you're staying compliant with the SEC. They appreciate that stuff. So there's things like that. Uh, and, and another tool I use is uh, if I'm doing a JV or uh, working with a new company, a lot of times I use this other company called Prescient, P-R-E-S-C-I-E-N-T. And this is great for any passive investor uh, to vet. Uh, it's a company that will do background checks on individuals or businesses it's a great tool it has three levels of service not super expensive does international as well as domestic very quick turnaround so i utilize tools like that today that you know i probably didn't do years ago you know when I mean, you do jvs with like if you're going to take down a large 50 million 100 million dollar pool or something and you would need to partner with another sidecar with another fund or something like that you do some due diligence Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just a, um, it's just a tool that way. So it's, uh, I think a lot of it's around the compliance arena for me, especially with investors. We also utilize uh, software and it, it enables a better, uh, you know, I always joke around. It's the PPR experience, you know, um, but you get what I mean by that. You know, how do you have a customer for life? What's your customer for life program, right? It's the, 
And some of that involves software, having a portal, having statements. Can you robust up your reporting, your financials? Um, you know, today we, we audit everything today. In the old days, we didn't. Now, there's a cost of some of that stuff. I'm not saying, you know, everybody should run out and have an audit. Uh, Enron was audited. And I'm sure there's other. <laughs> so it, 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 it doesn't necessarily dictate outcome, right? It, but it's um, – Sure, it's a nice, uh, you know, it just shows that you're, you know, dotting more I's and crossing more T's, the more of that that you do. Uh, just like, uh, you know, we, we do a lot with our portfolio evaluation today, and we're working towards having more and more robust reporting. You know, you might start out as yearly reporting, eventually get to quarterly reporting, eventually get to monthly reporting. Uh, we're working with a, a company right now, they do daily reporting but their investors are billion dollar funds, right? Yeah. So it, I can't even get my mind around daily reporting. That you got to be pretty robust as you daily. You're, you're, you're like Vanguard at that point or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. I mean, it's it, running a, running a fund or, or raising capital, I should say is a whole nother business. And I had no idea yeah. when I first got, when I launched my first fund in 2013, you know, coming from a real estate background, flipping houses to being a fund manager. I'm like, okay, set up this vehicle, you go out, raise some money, but there's, like you just mentioned, there's so many back-end things that you need to do to make sure it's set up right, that you're compliant and continuing um, to be able to run it efficiently. Because anybody can be a fund manager, but is, are you an efficient fund manager who communicates with your investors, who give reporting and do what you're supposed to do? That's a whole nother business. So you, know, you almost, almost have to have the automation systems and processes and everything in place in those third-party companies to assist you with that. Like we were doing things in house. Now today we have a third party fund admin who give reporting and a portal and all that good stuff. So I definitely get it. But now transitioning to you, you when I first met you guys, you were doing predominantly seconds and then you transitioned to first. And I know it was, a, it was a scalability thing there where you started to raise a, a certain amount of capital. It was like, okay, how many seconds can you buy? And also I'm right. Thinking, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, investors are more used to, okay, raising capital for first. For me, it's always been easier versus educating and telling people about seconds and them getting over the risk mentality and then investing. So was it a little bit of both of that, which made you guys, because you raised a bunch of money and it was easier for first or, you know, which one was it? Um, I mean, in? yes and no. I, I think it's um – Wow. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. The, the, you know, with junior lean, sure. It, initially it's a tougher sale. I think a lot of it has to do with a combination of things of how familiar is the audience with the product? What's your track record? How well do we tell the story of how, you know, really, you know, any investor, their, their concern is what's the risk? Um, can I get, can I get a return on my capital? Can I get my, my capital return to me, right? That's their real, that's their issues, right? Mm. And how do I do that safely? And it, it you're just, it's all about managing risk and whether you're dealing with first, second, uh, it could be unsecured. There's ways to handle risk. And I guess it's, uh, you know, the better and more experienced you are at managing risk and demonstrating the ability to do so. I think the investors just have to get comfortable and confident in whatever it is that you're doing to say, hey, these people seem like they really know, you know, that management team really is solid. Uh, you know, they have their sources of product. Yes, they are good at execution. It, it, so it's not just about uh, the raising of the capital, how well can they manage the funds, manage the money, and, uh, you know, and demonstrate that. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I know, um, you know, no, no one is perfect. We all have flaws and we all learn from our mistakes. What are some of the challenges that you're going through um, or you see that every business has challenges, right? No one, everybody's on Facebook crushing it and doing good and everything else. Um, you know, <laughs> same circles and some of the same masterminds and we, we're, we become vulnerable. We are able to share and express some of the challenges we have and open up. What are some of the challenges that, that you, you're having as far as a business that you may feel as though it's a bottleneck, you know, if you want to share whatever, and then trying to get yourself to the next level that you might want to share with the group to look out for, you know. Yeah, it's funny you say that. What's my partner Bob say? I, I never had a bad day. <laughs> uh, that's his line, right? Uh, the, um, 
No, there's always something in business. Like you, you mentioned, um, I don't know if you mentioned on this call where you have the three pillars, I call them where it's sourcing a product, it's capital and it's uh, scalability or execution. Yeah. And, or execution. It's, it's similar. And, and it's, you know, how many deals could you do if the deals were free, right? How many, how many notes could you buy if you had unlimited capital? Those types of questions get you thinking as to scale, for example. And then, you know, it's just like money. I remember when we started our company, money was the issue. And I remember our goal at the time, this is years ago, our goal was 50000 a month, Fuqua, and that's what we were trying to raise. And today, you know, we've had million, multi-million dollar days. And uh, it's kind of funny when you see that happen. Uh, but it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen. So, so sometimes money is your issue and then eventually you're able to raise enough capital and then you're like, well, I need more product. And then you have more product. Well, and now I need more help. You know, it just, it, <laughs> and that, that never goes away. Right. So it's, uh, the bad part is when you need two or three of them, that's when you know you're in trouble. Right. So, yeah. um, but I think, I think all businesses have these growing pains. And for me, coaching has been a big deal. I've had always had coaches and mentors for the last, definitely the last uh, many years now. And, um, you know, some of my coaches have coached really big companies. Um, you know, I've had some really high level coaches today. So they've been immensely helpful. And They'll, they'll tell you, they'll say, hey, when you get to this number of employees, you're going to have these particular headaches. And when you get to this number of, you know, uh, revenue generation, you're going to have these headaches. And, and it's interesting that the headaches that they demonstrate at different levels of the business are so accurate that you're like amazed. But the reason they can do that is their experience. They have a lot of experience in large companies or larger companies, and it, it, they can kind of predict the growing pains. You know, you get over 30 employees, you almost need an HR person, right? So it's a, that's an example because you start, you know, next thing you know, the CEO or COO is dealing with HR issues one day a week or something if you add it up all the time, if you didn't have someone. Uh, and, you know, in the beginning, you might start with my part-time HR, right, so, uh, where you outsource it, and then you decide to bring it in-house. I mean, just think about all the things that we bring in-house that we put out, that we outsource later or things that we outsource today that we bring in house yeah, tomorrow. It, it, it's funny how that like flips and uh, we go back and forth with that. And I think it's smart to do that. You got to evaluate, you know, what are we doing today? Like it could be servicing, for example, we, that's a perfect example of, I, I don't really call them mistakes or failures. I really look at everything as no, learning. challenges. Yeah, challenges you yeah not know. even that. Like, I always look at it as, so I never feel like I failed at anything. I always felt like I learned different things. For example, um, you know, one time we were going down the servicing path, and, you know, we do have a lot of licenses. We do have a servicing arm, but we, we thought about doing it, you know, full blown. And, you know, spent significant money and time, energy, and then decided – now it was really not no it was really not now you know and or it wasn't enough scale or it wasn't enough margins for us and um and it can be that way with a lot of things and now that doesn't mean we you know you might say somebody might come up to me five or ten years from now and say you said you were never going to do servicing and now you do you know or whatever uh so you never know you could go buy a service or or who knows you might change your mind there's an old saying, buy your biggest headache, right? If your headache was, uh, you know, I'm having trouble with roofers, so I started a roofing company, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so then yeah. the roofer shows up at your job first, right? So uh, you can relate to that, right, Fuqua? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, you could say the same thing in any business where you, from a business development standpoint, you try another vertical. Maybe it's hard money. Maybe it's, you know, right now, you know, it could be a trade desk. It could be whatever it is, you know, in your business. Yeah, you have, you have this such calm demeanor, but most people don't know you. You about get you about a GSD, you know, get get stuff done. <laughs> we were just talking. <laughs> you were telling me, oh, you know, you from going from real estate to going to closing and changing clothes and doing this and doing that, whatever it takes to get it done. And now you whatever it takes. All this experience and you in a position where you're helping others. I was at the the Mid-Atlantic Summit event, which was a really great event. You guys broke the record on how much money that was raised. And that actually inspired me. I don't know if I told you at the last Mastermind event we was at, I don't know if I told you, but that inspired me to actually 
create something similar to that, right? So, um, you know, shameless plug, I'm actually now working on a shelter for uh, bad women and children, which is slated, um, you know, if the variants and everything go through, you know, to start the ground in sometime in 2020 or after that. But that event going last That's year. That's awesome. The fundraising part was just so impactful. I was just like, wow, you know, it's, it was amazing to see people contribute to that and want to see um, the success of other people in that way. So hats off to you guys for starting that. And you've always had that, that, um, that uh, organization, or you had one for the bad women and children, but this one is for, for the homeless that you created. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this that one was for Project Home, but the I, I always had this uh, thing for I didn't always think this way, but I guess the last fifteen, twenty years where I was like, Well, how do we invest and be more impactful, right? We we're really good at what we do sometimes. You know, hopefully we're good at some of the things we do. And like for you, for example, you're very good at, you know, whether it's taking a property and turning it around and getting it back into the community. Well, why not take it another level or you're good at raising capital. Why not raise capital for, you know, uh, more impactful, something more impactful. It doesn't matter what it is. I, I just love to hear these stories that, Hey, if I inspired anybody, that's great. Um, because I think, it, you know, somebody inspired me, obviously, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, a lot of times we don't, you know, we're in business, we're up to our eyeballs in business and we don't think of some of the other things we could do. You know, I was always in a real estate related business, but I always found irony in the fact that, um, for example, you know, I own, at one point I owned 40 places, yet I had family members that were homeless. The irony there is just off the charts to me. Like, how does that even happen, right? Mm. Or someone is, you know what I mean? So I, I was like, well, there's ways to, I can't help everybody, but I can help in other areas where I can help people who are experts in their area with, by combining what I'm, what I do, right? So like, like Sister Mary at Project Home, I, I'm not that good with the homeless. I, I, when I see a homeless person, I really don't know how to help them or what to say to them or what to do. Am I enabling them? Am I helping them? I, you know, do I give them money? Do I give them my sandwich? Do I buy them a sandwich? Do, you know, I don't know what to do. So, but Sister Mary does. And I'm good at raising capital, right? So let me go do my gig. I'll go raise my money and help sister in that way, you know, because she understands it intimately. Right. So it's the same way um, in a lot of other fields. You know, I work with my son on that one project, um, which is dealing with recovery. I'm not, you know, I, I know a lot about recovery today from owning a place for 10 years, but at the time I didn't know anything about it, but I partnered with somebody in recovery to, to run the recovery. And I was good at the, the capital and the real estate and, and that stuff and combined forces. You know, we've had over a thousand residents over the years. So that's powerful, right? It helps the community. And Absolutely. we, we still do well with our real estate investing too. So it's, you can have a double whammy effect. Like, you know, I think it's something that's definitely needed for every investor that is out there, um, you know, reaping the rewards from from the, the real estate business to you know be impactful, which whatever way. So I also want to talk about the book. Like I know it's not even <laughs> book together. You know, it's it's. I didn't I didn't realize you wrote a book. Did you? What book? What <laughs> no, your book. Title of your book. <laughs> your book. <laughs> I, I have three, sir. Um, I have three. <laughs> you have three uh, books. I, See, I'm, I'm, I'm behind. Uh, I'm behind uh, the game. You have three books. I only have one. But you know what it is? I, those books I wrote when my kids were in like track practice and I was in the car sitting on the sideline waiting when I had time and I couldn't do business. So I had to actually release some of my energy from my business going you know, crazy every day to, into a book. So it was like a therapy for me. But your book is really good. Appreciate you taking the time <laughs> and sharing um, you know, your journey. Uh, with everyone. What, what was the inspiration behind that? What, what was like the purpose of that? Well, I mean, I wanted to, well, I never, I, at the time I felt like um, it, it was, it was really intended to be just a general introduction to notes, you know, and, and I was trying to cover, you know, it, it's hard to do, right. It's hard to talk about everything. It, it would be hard to talk about everything in real estate in one book, for example, it's really hard to talk about everything in notes in one book. It really wasn't a book on collections or anything. We had courses on that in the past, you know, that, um, so I wanted to do something different for, 
more of the general public to understand that there's this whole world of notes going on around you, whether you realize it or not. Uh, and then a little bit of my journey as well of how you could look at money and finance and notes differently, maybe, and to realize, um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on there. And most people are in the shadows. They don't even realize what's happening around them or to them in regards to banking and finance. It's kind of this taboo thing, you know, you send your money to us and we'll manage it for you type mentality as opposed to behind the curtain, right? It's like the Wizard of Oz when it comes to finance sometimes. Yeah, that's awesome. And you also have a, another, uh, where you're the co-founder and board member of another group, Strategic Investor Alliance, um, you know, purposeful planning and networking group for accredited investors. I think that was a genius idea to create an environment where accredited investors can come and share other alternative investment strategies that, you know, they're investing in. You have, uh, you know, speakers, all different types of speakers that uh, dwell in that, that arena of, of of alternative investments come and speak and share stuff with their own. So that, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll close out on that. Um, and yeah, I think that was great. I've been to about two events um, so far. I know you have more than that, but I was able to make it to two of them. And I think the caliber of the people that's there and the information that's, that's given is, is pretty powerful. Let's talk a little bit about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think there was a couple of reasons why I did that. I, um, me and a, like you said, a couple of board members, it was a, you know, a securities attorney, an accountant, a self-directed IRA custodian, and a, and a financial planner kind of combined our networks together to bring our best customers to. It was like a value add for our clients, as well as it was somewhat selfish in a way where I enjoy that type of thing. And I also, um, like we have, uh, policies at our company like where i can't buy a note from our company we're not allowed to buy our notes from ourselves we don't want to be accused of you know stripping good assets from our funds or anything and then we also because i'm a principal in my company my retirement accounts can not invest in my company right so i'm always looking for alternative investments i'm always looking and then i also think there's a, a room to bring in advisors right and i think it's a great place to you know, I got the idea from the family office space. You know, years ago I sold insurance and uh, I saw how family offices did things. They basically had investment committees and advisory boards and would bring in all these experts and, and look over all these alternative investments. And I was like, how cool would it be to form a group like Yelp to, you know, to vet alternative investments and advisors? And uh, we all have the same issues, right? We're especially the smaller millionaires. Most of the folks in my group are under 25 million in assets, I'd say. And uh, it's kind of neat. We all have the same problems, whether it's family governance or legacy planning or retirement planning and tax planning, estate planning, all these different things. Um, so I think it's a real cool place to bring all the forces into the room together and, uh, that way, if there's questions come up, there's always an accountant in the room. There's always an attorney in the room. There's always, and it, it's a great venue to, you know, get these things, get more done, you know, get more, uh, share resources, basically. <laughs> you know, when I left that, my, my purpose of coming there was also to receive information, but I was like, I have to do something like that. And I immediately started something that flopped. It was called the Intelligent Investor Alliance, and it never got off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> All of the pieces behind the scene. I mean, when people do stuff, it looks easy, right? Like, oh, I can do that. Oh, uh, yeah. When I started to put it, I said, you know what? I'm just going to focus on what I'm doing. I'm not even getting involved with that. I'm just going to stay focused on, on this no business and doing what I'm doing. So <laughs> definitely take my hat off to you for doing that because it takes a lot of planning, especially with the event like Mid-Atlantic Summit. You know, it takes a lot of planning and people just think it's, you know, one quarter, but it's something that happens continuously to make it a great um, experience for people. So definitely appreciate you putting on a summit and having a group where uh, accredited investors can attend and learn more information about alternative investments. Oh man, this is, this is a, uh, this is pretty great. Anything you want our listeners to know how to reach you information, they can find out. You can, you know, go to uh, pprnoteco.com, check them out. He on Instagram too. What's your Instagram handle? <laughs> I don't have an Instagram handle. I, I, I probably do. I don't. I don't know what it is. I yo my uh, my marketing team's gonna be like, what's up, <laughs> Um 
probably the best way people reach me is a lot of times, believe it or not, it's usually on LinkedIn because we have a distressed uh, mortgages group on LinkedIn. And a lot of times they'll reach out to me on bigger pockets. Uh, Cause we answer questions oh, yeah, literally daily bigger pockets. on bigger pockets. Yeah. yeah you do a lot of so we do a lot. We do a little bit on bigger pockets. Oh man. You yeah. got the whole bigger pocket. Nope. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> yeah. We do a lot. We do a little bit on there as well. So yeah, we definitely, uh, you know, there's a note group on there and there's, um, you know, there's always a conversation going on. Yeah. That's awesome. Right. Thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. PFREI, Passion for Real Estate Investments. Check us out on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. Oh, there you go. Talk shows. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. Thank, hey, thanks, Fuquan, for having me on. I really appreciate it, bud. Good luck no with problem. everything.